nice to be here because actually, as Rainer told, I will talk about uh, tip and hands Raman spectroscopy, but actually, this is not the total truth. Uh, I'm quite new in near field optical microscopy, and yeah, we have uh, at least now one quite one year uh, complete new SNOM, and we decide to use it also as a SNOM as a near field microscope. But uh, yeah, Rainer said, why are you, why are you doing it in, in the visible? And actually, I came the first time into touch with the SNOM. It was in 2016. It was with Rainer and San Sebastian, and we come up with the idea: let's combine a Raman spectrometer to the SNOM. And after half a year of tough work, uh, we get a finally a really nice running combined TERS with a SNOM setup, and uh, we get a very, very nice uh, two publications out of that. So it was a very, very productive time. And at this moment, when I go back to Berlin, we decide in Berlin, come on, let's buy a SNOM, let's, let's look for money, maybe we have some, and luckily Steffi Reich uh, gets an ERC grant, and we are able to buy a SNOM also with spectrometer. And then we think about, okay, where, where's our playground? And our playground, our powerful, we come from really from Raman spectroscopy, we come from the visible, we are not working in the infrared, and also not many experience with infrared. So, but let's go one step back, and uh, uh, Harvey told a lot, uh, a lot of about polaritons, about of plasmon polaritons, phonon polaritons, so I don't have to introduce to it. And we think about, okay, we are in the visible, and why we should care about, about the visible? It's because of MOS2 and tungsten selenide. So here we, here we have excitons, and the excitons have huge binding energy. They can be excited in the visible range, and uh, they can have very long lifetime. And the first results of uh, how such exciton polariton can be visible are, are by, by U et al. I hope um, I say the name right. Here you see traveling wave-guided exciton polariton inside molybdenum D selenide, about a really, really long distance. I think they mentioned above 12 micrometer, even, or maybe even 14 or 16. And this is at E at an energy of 1.35 electron volt. And for us, uh, from, from Raman spectroscopy point of view, this is al already infrared. So Rainer said this is visible, but for me it's already infrared. So what, what we do and what we decide, okay, let's take the near spec and let's slightly change it. And what we have do, done, we have just removed the helium neon laser, which is commonly used, and replaced it by a C-wave, which is tunable from 450 nanometer to 650, and in the infrared region of 900 to 1300. Additionally, we have, again, also a Raman spectrometer installed that we can do tip-enhanced Raman and SNOM in simultaneous way. And a sample, we decided to go to MOS2 because MOS2 has a B exciton and the B exciton uh, could be excited around 630 nanometer excitation. So we go to this wavelength and we take this beautiful, beautiful picture together with, uh, with AFM. And this near field image you see nicely, so it's not that nice visible here now, uh, the fringes, how far they, they, they are going in, inside the material. And the first question is, okay, why the, how the fringes are created, which interference uh, causes these fringes. And we have two possibilities. We can launch an exciton polariton, which travels to the edge, is reflected by the edge, go back to the tip, and then goes to, a, to the detector. Or a second option, like uh, claimed already by, by you by, at, uh, in molybdenum deselenide, we launch an exciton polariton, it's wave-guided to the edge, it recombines at the edge, is collected by the parabolic neurons and interfered by directly backscattered light here. And we see these fringes. For sure, we can trust the data of who, but actually, I like to prove data, and uh, the easiest way to prove it is to make orientation-dependent nanoimaging. That means we just start turning the sample by 90-degree steps, and if the exciton polariton will travel to the edge and is back-reflected, collected by the tip, we would expect for each uh, orientation of the sample the same picture. What we actually see is, and uh, you, at all also, uh, you uh, also say out that dependent on how the sample is rotated, we see different pictures. This is, in this case, the beam comes perpendicular to the, to, the edge, to the edge, goes to the edge, and is collected. When we turn it by 180 degrees, the edge of the MOS2 is away from the parabolic mirror, so it is away, it's looking away from the detector, the photons of the edge, of the recombined exciton, in, uh, in our point of view, didn't reach the detector, and that means we see no fringes here, as expected. And also, when we turn it by 90 degree or 20, uh, 270 degree, we also saw, saw different pictures. We saw fringes, and, uh, but they are denser and have a different wavelength. So this is the first indication that uh, we have the same uh, situation like who reported for molybdenum deselenide that we excite an exciton polariton, it goes to the edge, we combine and then to the detector. But we have now a spectrometer, a Raman spectrometer, and here the combination of both techniques is very interesting. The point is we can do now also tears. 
And in this, this region, uh, we have two choices. The exciton polariton is launched, goes to the, to the edge, and if it's back reflected, and we com what we combine some somehow here or, or collect it at the tip, that would mean that the signal, the near field signal at the tip, would be also somehow increased, and this would affect the tip enhanced Raman intensity. So what we have done, we first of all make a tip up, tip down spectrum. Here you see the tip down, here tip up. Here the characteristic modes of MOS2 appear when we reach the tip, it was close to the edge mate, and then we make a, a line scan. That means we take as a function of tip position a line here, a, a, a Raman line scan, and uh, trace the intensity for the E2G and A1G mode. And what we see it, unfortunately, I was really hoping that this signal would be somehow modulated when we follow this line scan here, the stairs like that. We see a straight line, we see here no modulation inside. That means that, yeah, as, as uh, claimed in before, that uh, the exciton goes to the edge through the material, like, uh, like a bulk exciton goes to the edge and recombines at the edge and do not do any contribution to the near field, and therefore we can really argue, I think, that uh, we have this exciton which travels, uh, is waveguided through the material to the edge. So, next, this was all done by one uh, excitation wavelength. Here you see the terse imaging was done by 580 nanometer. You see here also some PL, but I do not want to discuss it. I don't know what it is actually here. I would just look at the Raman data. Uh, and in the next step, I mentioned we have a continuous tunable laser, which is uh, uh, also continuous wave. And uh, what we can do then is uh, to measure the dispersion of the exciton polaritons. Therefore, therefore, you just have to measure such nice pictures, such, such, such nice SNOM pictures, as a function of excitation energy. And we did it and extract at each excitation energy uh, a line, here like a line scan. We plot it, make the Fourier tra transformation, and from the peak position, we can get nicely Okay, here's also something interesting. We can uh, nicely get our uh, wavelength of the, of the exciton polariton. Furthermore, what we can get is uh, from the line width here, we can get also the maximum propagation length. And we see we also get in our, uh, in our measurements around about 10 micrometer propagation length. And the very interesting uh, point is, now not okay that we can also do a different uh, thickness of, of MOS2 and we see that it decreases. But the, the very, very interesting point is that from such, such all calculations, we get uh, this dispersion, we get our Q over E, E over Q, and the dependence of the energy and the momentum. And uh, from the physics, uh, what we see is, okay, we have here a splitting between uh, upper and lower exciton polariton branches, which is common. We see here backbending, so the data goes really like from up and down. We go from, from one to the other. We see that for the coupling strength, get for uh, smaller uh, sample, for thinner sample, it gets higher. But the really point is, I'm coming from Raman spectroscopy, and every time you're doing Raman spectroscopy, like for MOS2, uh, Pimenta is doing a lot of uh, MOS2 and special resonance Raman spectroscopy, is you want to explain your data what you measure. And to explain your data, what you have measured, you want to calculate them, for example, by DFT. And it is very common that, in, uh, that you use, uh, uh, in, in the calculation, uh, you have to use excitonic picture. That means you have to take into account that your Raman process in MOS2 is somehow mediated by excitons, especially when you launch them by the tip. And the point is, in all calculations, there are a lot of appro approximation for the exciton. They are treated as single particle, and then huge, uh, uh, huge paper are written about motivation, why you can treat an exciton uh, as a single particle, and, and how you get your Q for your exciton. And we have here now the very nice possibility that we have our Q. We have measured our Q, so we can plug it in into a theory and calculate it, and, and look how our Raman spectra behave as a function of excitation energy. And, now to the very, very last data, uh, which is also measured like two weeks ago, finally. Uh, here we are. We have here now th three spectrum and 596, 630, and 648 nanometer. And here things happen in MOS2. First of all, we see when we go to the band gap uh, close to the, to the excit uh, exciton energy 630, the E2G mode completely disappear. And also the E1G is lowered. Secondly, we have here an acoustic phonon branch, which is quite broad and could be fitted with two Laurentians. And when you look at the position of, of these two peaks, you see that they see a linear behavior. This is expected. But what we also see when we come to this, uh, uh, to, to this transition from upper to lower uh, polaritonic branch, you see here such a dip. You see it here and you see it here. 
And now actually we can say, okay, we have our theory, we, uh, we have our measurements, and we can now do DFT, and we have our Q from our SNOM measurements, and I would, it would be great just to click now and show you a line how, which reproduced everything, but at least as mentioned, we finished just this measurement, and we are not ready to, uh, to we, we do not have a theory yet ready, we want to make the calculation, and then publish all the data, and we believe that this is a really promising work to combine both, but yeah, up to now, there, uh, we are not so far. And uh, we have also much more work because uh, yesterday a new laser arrived, uh, which is tunable from 660 to 700 nanometer, and then we can reach also the A exciton energy, and we can compare the, 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 the propagation length and also the dispersion of A and B exciton in MOS2. We aim also to somehow to launch excitons in, uh, in MOS2 and monolayer MOS2, compare a conventional Raman spectra to tip enhanced Raman spectra, what does really do that when we excite the Raman process by a tip. So a lot of fundamental research. And with that, I uh, show you hopefully uh, the promising work of visible SNOM, so real visible SNOM. And thank you for your attention.